Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, renowned touring and recording drummer, Ron Wixo. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, rock and rollers? Yep, your clock is right. Your iPhone is correct. It's that time. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. Today is so exciting because I've got an old friend. We haven't seen each other in a long, long time, but just recently I went to go see him play his butt off with the Steve Miller Band at the First Bank Arena. We have this new uh, little amphitheater outside of Franklin, Tennessee, so I got to go with my friend Tom Van Skyke, who did 25 years with Robert Earl Keane and is now a Nashvillian. Yeah. We went to go see our friend play. This gentleman, world-class drummer, originally hailing from Delaware, but then growing up in Long Island, New York, 23 years in L.A., then an Austin, Texas guy. Now he's outside of Omaha. He can't stay put. He's always on the move, and these are some of the folks he's played with Steve Miller, Cher, Richie Sambora, Foreigner, David Lee Roth, The Storm, Greg Rowley, Eddie Money, CCR, the list goes on and on. Our friend Ron Wixo. What's up, buddy? Hey, Rich. How are you, man? Oh, man. It's good good. to see. I I had to have the readers for the, you know, the fine print. (laughs) I hear you. I just went and got a new prescription yesterday, but I'm not wearing any right now. Yeah, what for distance? Yeah, oh, that that's good. You know, you just put the you put the music stand far away. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) So, if you guys are uh, just listening to this, you won't see that um, Ron is in his drum room. It looks like a a, a treasure trove of a candy land of sorts. Oh yeah, well I've got there's a bunch of memorabilia up on the wall, which probably wouldn't have been on the wall if it weren't for Marcy. You know, she did all that stuff. I would have had it in a box, you know. <laughs> so I got but, to uh, meet your girlfriend Marcy at the amphitheater. That she seems like yeah. a very nice young lady. Well, she's great, and I'm, I'm very lucky to be with her. <laughs> How long have you guys been together? Uh, it's close to ten years, I think. Oh wow, years, incredible! Like that yeah. Nine, now nine I, was, or 10. I was looking at her website. She. Uh, it looks like she does a lot of things like I do. It seems like she's a songwriter, but also does some inspirational speaking and such. Yeah, she and she's a really good singer, and she does music that you know the the kind of the point of the most of the music that she does is for comforting people that might be going through a rough time or that type of thing, you know. And and so uh, you know, it's, it's meant to be inspirational, motivational, healing kind of you know. That type of thing, and uh, and so you know, I, I I help her with that. I I put together a lot of that music with some friends of ours. I got uh, a good buddy Matt, uh, named Wally Minko who plays keyboards, and he's he's been with everybody, Jean Luc Ponty and Wow Arturo Sandoval, and you know just a million people, and, and he played with me in the Greg Raleigh band, and uh, you know Tom Jones and Pink and yeah. and Vogue, and you know just and and Matt Bissonette, who you know. Uh, I'm sure you know he plays bass on on all that stuff, and uh, he's out with Elton John and it's Greg Bissonnette's brother, and Matt's played with like a zillion people too, you know, yeah. Ringo and ELO, ELO and yeah. Joe Satriani. In fact, he texted me just a couple weeks ago and said, "Man, Joe Satriani called me and he said he w- he wanted me to do a couple gigs with him, and they were opening for Steve Miller." And I was like, "Oh man, I wish he could do it." And it, it turns out he is. Uh, Oh, it's, uh, Joe is opening two shows for us in uh, uh, New York at Jones Beach and uh, Bethel Woods, uh, you know, up at Woodstock at July 1st and 2nd. And so nice. uh, I was hoping Matt could do it, but he can't. He's out with Elton. Um, and uh, I think Kenny Aronoff is doing that, though. Kenny Aronoff is so doing cool. the Satriani gig, which is it's crazy because some things have come up. I saw some like big TV award show type things and tributes that he was he would always be the house drummer for. But, yeah. you know, it's interesting. Like, I guess you have to look at your calendar and go, well, that's a lot of exposure and I could just do that or I could have like four months of touring the world. You know, so sometimes, right, right. as you know, yeah. very, very well. You got to pick. Yeah. <laughs> but your career, it just seemed like, so I was looking at your, at Ron Wixo, W I K S O.com. I, I think it's a new website, 2021. It's really great. Is that, did I read oh, that right? I, I, I started, I put that together myself. I, I know how to do websites. So I, and, and it's, it's a work in progress. Like most yeah. of them are, you know, and uh, there's a, a bunch of stuff that I haven't finished, but I do have, you know, a bunch of stuff about my career and, 
and about uh, you know some records I've played on and videos I've done and yeah. you know drum tracks that I do here in the studio and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, you know it's it's relatively new. I, I've had a website for years, but then I kind of neglected it for a long time. So I finally said oh, I probably should update this thing. You, you got to do a new one like every ten years or so. I try to get ten years out of them. You know, I'm on my third <laughs> one, man. But you don't yeah. know it does look really great. And there's a lot of information and a lot of storytelling about your career. You can almost see in chron a chronological order how you acquired a gig, the experience you had doing it, and then what happened to that kind of motivated the switch to another act. And it just seemed like every year, every couple of years of your life, you were with an with a new act. Um, was Cher the big first one that started it off all f for you? I mean, in terms of like the highest profile, probably. Yeah. You know, yeah. I did a few other things before that, you know, not, I wouldn't call it on the same level as, you know, types of gigs and yeah. uh, exposure and that sort of thing. But, uh, but yeah, you know, that was, that was, I guess the first big one, you know, I was 28 or nine or something like that. Oh, perfect. That. Perfect age, like a friend. You know, I was like thinking about all those friends on Friends. They were so young and vibrant and virile, like at the top of their. There's only one way to go down. But you know, Jennifer <laughs> Aniston did pretty good. Um, oh, yeah. You know, they 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 all did pretty good. Um, but so was that the sheer era where she's on the battleship with the wearing the yeah. wearing the uh, fishnet? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, she did that video for uh, "If I Could Turn Back Time," which is the song you're talking about. Yeah. Um, that video i think she did that right before she put the band together so the band isn't in that video it's just a, you know a bunch of actors really i think and uh although her son elijah is in that and and the guitar player who did wind up being in the band uh, david shelley he was in that video but the rest of it is none of those guys were in the band that toured with her and then she put the band together right after that so that was uh summer of 1989 and then uh we toured that record and then did a bunch of other stuff you know after that Amazing. And I'm looking back at some of these clips and I forgot that you, you may still be, but you were a big sonar guy. Yeah, I'm still a sonar. I've been oh, a sonar, still sonar endorser since, yeah, I've been a sonar endorser since 1990. Yeah. Look at you. That is a, that's, that's a, I'm trying to do the math in my head. That's a long time. 33 years. Yeah. <laughs> that's really great. So I, I, you know, I was there a good decade. Um, and then it just, I was trying to do clinics and stuff and it was just hard to get the kits, yeah. you know? It's hard to get, yeah. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of gigs, you know, backline where you, you know, rented backline stuff, and it's it's hardly ever available, unfortunately. And so I wind up, you know, having to play whatever they have, DW or you know, Yamaha or whatever they have. And and I've talked to Sonar about it, and unfortunately, you know, it's I, you know, they're they're a European based company, and they do have a presence here, but it's not, you know, it's not the same level as. Yeah. you know those other companies unfortunately but and strong but pretty strong friends. in canada like the like you know i did yeah. a, like a bunch of long and mcquade clinics up there and there it's mm -hmm. it's pretty represented up there but you know i'd always joke if i ever had to go to la and play a television show and jack dejanet or danny carey needed a drum set i was i was out of luck <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or, steve smith, yeah. or steve smith yeah, yeah. um yeah. but i mean just the product just the uh it was really it's just a really unique and well-crafted instrument Oh, they're they're great drums. I use them all the time. That's what I, that's what's right behind me is a Sonar Designer kit, and with it, which I've had for, gosh, I've had them probably almost thirty years. These drums. I used them with David Lee Roth and with Foreigner. And wow. uh, in fact, I think the Foreigner bass drum head is still on the front of this one, if I remember right. Oh my God! Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. so, so uh, your career lineage, I mean, you could almost look on your website and you could kind of see uh, this gig begets that gig begets that gig. But I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a that's an amazing rock pedigree. You're currently with Steve Miller, but Foreigner, you got the, that's like the American classic rock songbook. Those songs, I mean, Cold as Ice, Feels Like the First Time, Dirty White Boy, and then David Lee Roth. Um, just amazing. I'm sure you got some stories there. Is is there a book in you? Are you going to be able to share some of these stories? I mean, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess some people have actually mentioned that to me a few times, and I always just say, I don't know who would read it. <laughs> Drummers. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess maybe some people would would dig it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, I've been very fortunate for thirty whatever years, thirty five years of doing this. I've been a lot of places with a lot of these amazing acts and amazing musicians and and uh yeah there's there's some stories you know <laughs> <laughs> you could tell me but then you'd have to kill me but what i love uh, yeah, about right. you know a, a lot of these huge rock acts is 
you know, my my gig is very comfortable. I mean, we just hit every place you could possibly hit in the United States, and now we're just on this thing where we do the 48 states over and over and over, but I hardly ever have to cross a body of water. So you are like everywhere, seven continents. Do you, what's the, what would, are some insights or some advice you have on international touring? Because I got a real sensitive stomach. You know, if I spent a lot of time in South Asia or India, I think I would have a lot of problems. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm kind of a picky. I'm not like Mr. Worldwide Palette. You know, I'm a little bit picky about But there's plenty of good stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, you shouldn't worry about that. If you get yeah. the opportunity, I would say to go. Yeah. You know, I, I've... I've really loved going to all the places I've been. And there's a whole bunch of, that I haven't gotten to that I'd love to, but you know, that's one of the perks of this business. If you do get onto a, you know, a tour that takes you to some of those places, you know, go see it. I mean, I went to Monte Carlo and I spent like, uh, we had a day off there when I was there and I, I, I probably walked, you know, 15 miles, <laughs> just went everywhere, tried to see as much as I could, you know? Yeah. And it's great. You know, it's, it's inspiring culturally. I've you know, gone to a bunch of like, castles and museums and just you know walked around the cities in europe and and in yeah. japan you know there's some great stuff there too the, the japanese sure. fans are amazing too they somehow they know what flight you're going to be on and they're waiting for you when you get to the airport it's i mean crazy. yeah uh, it's crazy. crazy yeah like steve yeah. gad's like a god there and thomas uh, lang's a god in there uh, in china and uh, do, do you remember the band mr big of course pat torpy yeah god pat rest his soul yeah that, Pat was a good friend of mine, and uh, in fact, he was one of the guys who recommended me for the band The Storm, which I, which is a band I replaced Steve Smith in, which was, you know, I was quaking in my boots for that one. But, uh, but Pat, you know, Mr. Big, I remember him telling me too. You know, they they had a tough time in the states. They they couldn't really get that much going in the states. I mean, they did okay, but but in Japan, they were gods. I mean, yeah. they were just like. They sold out the Budokan, and he said he told me Japan just like put him in another tax bracket. You know, it's just like, and I remember when I was there with, uh, I can't remember if it was with David Lee Roth or Foreigner, but one of them, I I saw a, a local music industry magazine that they had, you know, yeah. whatever it was called, Tokyo Music or something, and there was like a music poll of of uh, you know best drummer, best guitar player, best band, and Mr. Big won or was in second in like every category. Amazing, you know, they were just huge there. So oh. it just goes to show you, you know, you can make a living lots of different ways, you know, and they, for them, you know, the Asia market was, especially Japan was huge for them. Yeah. So, you know, my friend, uh, David with the Hooters, you know, he was like a real inspiration, you know, cause when I was, I'd be sitting in my algebra class, sophomore year in high school, you know, thinking about that video and watching it was on MTV 27 times a day. And, <laughs> you know, now we're pals and everything. And he's been on the show and he said, you know, they, they toured internationally forever. They hadn't toured the States in so long this year. They're finally going out with uh, Rick Springfield. <laughs> oh, really? So, oh, yeah. Really cool. Okay, that's so it's cool. like you know you you get even one song and some tried and true fans and you keep that thing alive you can go and, and and keep that roof over your head man yeah yeah it's great no i mean steve with steve miller i mean this year is the 50th anniversary of the joker if you can believe i mean that. that's not that's nuts we used to do that in our set in the early days in the club days it was always a crowd pleaser yeah it still is <laughs> yeah <laughs> What so, I yeah. noticed about about that show was like Steve's got such a deep body of work and so many hits. Um, sometimes he would just hit the uh, intro verse chorus. Well, Steve, you know, <clears throat> Steve is seventy nine right now, and and he is, I mean, he's inspiring in in the sense that he is not just phoning it in. He's not like he's not, you know, he's interested in the music being good every night and and you know having the energy and playing well and all that stuff he practices the guitar on his bus you know he's not just coming out there playing the same licks he's trying different stuff and and uh you know for us you know he sometimes he just like does what he feels and it goes to some place that we've never gone you know like so we're just we got to follow him and and so you know we got to stay on our toes in, in this gig it's not it's not like a lot of gigs, you know, that I'm sure both of us have done where the arrangement is exactly the same every single night. That right. doesn't always happen. I mean, there are there are basic arrangements, but sometimes they vary depending on how he feels or, you know, what he feels like doing that night. And he doesn't always tell us. He just, like, gets into whatever he's into on the gig. And the, yeah. one time, 
my my third gig with him he uh the first gig i did was just a like a benefit show with a whole bunch of bands on it so we only played five songs thank goodness because i got the call for for that two days before it happened uh so it was like i didn't have time to learn everything but yeah but yeah. then a couple of weeks later we did two shows and uh on the second one of those shows <laughs> he uh we're, we're i forget which song we played but anyway we, we've stopped and he goes he gets on the mic and he goes i think i'm going to change the set and then he turns around and he looks at me and he goes and i looked at him and i went like and he goes why not <laughs> so he starts talking about this song called uh uh cow cow calculator it's from like the 60s so one of his early records yeah and the guys in the band knew the song but i'd never heard it before so he's talking about it and joseph wooten the keyboard player who's kind of the md he he was looking at me and he's going just like air drumming the part and showing me the bass room. and fortunately it was a very simple song and we you know we played it and um you know nobody really knew the difference but yeah but uh, it was it's just an example of the kind of thing that he just does, you know, and he kind of expects us all to be able to have big enough ears to follow what he's doing. And, yeah. And it's great. You know, it's, I, I look at that stuff as, uh, you know, some people might get terrified by it. I look at it like, well, it's partially terrifying, but but it's I, I just look at it like, you know, we're just in it. You know, we're in the moment. We're just doing yeah. what, you know, and it's like you've done a, like a million club gigs over the years they were like that you're, you're just doing too. it with a bigger you know, a bigger audience out there and the bigger fact audience, that yeah. you know you could take it as a as a compliment because you've got the chair he hired you because of you know not only your ability but you can jib and jab and go east go west yeah. you know you got the big he, ears he, he feels confident enough in the band that we're gonna you know we're gonna be there wherever he takes us you know wherever he decides to go and that's you know it is a compliment, and I and I and I appreciate that he feels that way about it. So yeah, yeah. and I'm I'm filling some big shoes on this gig too because the guy he had before me, Gordy Knudsen, is a great guy, great drummer, and he was with Steve for 33 years. So yeah, you know, he's used to having the drummer be able to catch whatever he's at, you know, because Gordy, you know, I mean, I'm sure he's seen everything Steve comes, you know, could come up with or whatever. You know? Now when now when did Gordy Gordy leave that gig? So, so Gordy left, uh, so the gig I was talking about a minute ago, the, the very first gig that I did with Steve was a, a benefit show for 9-11. It was for, for the Tunnel, Tunnel to Towers Foundation. It was at Jones Beach Amphitheater. Oh, yeah. And uh, Gordy, uh, you know, had some, there was some personal things going on, I guess. I think it was with his wife. I'm, I'm not, I don't ever want to get into any of that stuff because that's none of my business. But, uh, you know, he couldn't make it bottom line and so uh steve's manager is a guy named scott bure who i've known for 30 some years he was one of our managers in the storm along uh. with herbie herbert uh he called me up it was like a thursday morning i remember the date august 19th he called me up and um this is 2021 and he said uh he said hey what are you doing saturday <laughs> and i said i don't know nothing right now and he goes well uh I'm pretty sure that Gordy can't make this gig. Can you come and play with us in New York with Steve? And I was like, absolutely. Just, you know, tell me. And so, you know, after a couple of phone calls and confirming things, he says, all right, you know, I got, you know, you're on the flight tomorrow at 6 a.m. or whatever. Here's the five songs to learn. So they give me the five songs. And uh, I, I don't remember which ones they were right now. But anyway, so I learned them. You know, I did, I did what you do and what Kenny does and everybody I wrote out my charts, you know, and I had them on my iPad and I, I'm thinking, you know, here's the arrangements. And then I talked to Gordy and I, you know, talked to the, talk, talk to the keyboard player and, you know, it's like, all right, I got the arrangements before I found out that Steve doesn't necessarily stick to the arrangements, but anyway, um, <laughs> so I learned these songs and, uh, you know, got about an hour of sleep, went to the airport, flew to New York. And when I got there, they changed two of the songs. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> so God. I, I learned the, night, the other two in my hotel room, which was cool, you know, not not a big deal. And then we had a one-hour sound check that night, which was also my chance to learn that equipment, you know, because it was their gear and, you know, th there's an in-ear monitor system with a personal mixer and all nice. this stuff. I had to kind of figure all this stuff out. But we had one hour on the stage. And so... 
really we wound up with like 45 minutes to play but steve wasn't there it was just the band and the crew you know and so they all kind of walked me through everything well unbeknownst to me steve was watching the whole thing on a facetime video or whatever oh zoom my video God. on the phone and after we were done scott came up and says hey steve miller would like to say hello to you <laughs> so he hands me the phone and I was like, hey, Steve, how's it going? And he was super nice, super gracious and, you know, thanking me for doing it and everything. So I, the first time I played with Steve was in front of an audience on TV with, you know, uh, at, at Jones Beach. And I only met him about an hour before that. So I that, love so, that. Grace under pressure you know, was, and you're learning songs right to the downbeat. Yeah. And, and, and he was changing some of the arrangements in the dressing room because we only had us, we only had like a 25 minute time slot. Every, it, was, it was a very condensed show, you know, in fact, uh, Kenny was on that gig. He was playing with Fogarty. He, he, they were on like two acts before us. And then, um, journey closed the show after us. Wow. Um, and, and yeah, Ann Wilson was on it and the chain smokers were on it and Gavin DeGraw and yeah, just like, I don't know, it's a million people. The, yeah. Oh, and the house the house band was G. E. Smith, Paul Schaefer, Sean Pelton, you know. And I'm sitting here going, Boy, I hope I remember these songs. A lot of good drummers at Joan Be <laughs> Jones Beach that day, man. It was a fun, yeah, it was a fun game. We almost got canceled by a hurricane that was coming up the coast, but we made it. Oh my God! Have you, did you have you done the tunnel? Do you ever walk through the tunnel back oh, there? Yeah. The oh, it's sure. so so creepy and slimy. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. I've I've played there a bunch of times before, you know, with Sharon and Farmer yeah. and some of them. But yeah, and that's. That venue is, I guess you'd call it my home venue. It's right, you, right there, Long Island. It's you probably like saw 30. concerts there as a kid, right? And then, then you're playing there. Actually, no, I oh. never saw a show there. Huh. The first time I went there was when I played with Cher. And the reason why that venue, you know, where the seats are in front of the stage, that used to be water. They used to do like, uh, like theatrical kind of productions there, and like part of the production would be like, you know, boats. Swimming or boats or whatever yeah. in the in the water in front of the stage, you know that's why there's a tunnel, so that you can so that you can go under that water. Wow! To get to the stage, yeah. yeah. Then they filled that in and put seats there, but still the water comes right up to next to the seats. Yeah, every year we walk through the tunnel and we we'll we'll film it and then we'll add creepy music and we're like, this is our gay. <laughs> it's like something right out of a Saw movie. We're ready for the yeah. little guy on the tricycle to come around. Yeah. That's a beautiful place, though, especially if it's a nice day, you know. Yeah, if it's a nice day, it is unstoppable. Yeah, one of our yeah. iconic venues, man. Well, I, you know, I just, I loved seeing you play. I mean, I've always been a big fan of your playing, but I was like eight rows back watching you play, just swinging those sticks. Uh, super powerful traditional grip, um, oh, which is totally it's rare it's a rare grip you know what i mean when i was coming up and i think we both started playing the drums the same age i was uh, six or seven years old and mm -hmm. my teacher was a matched grip player so i never learned traditional grip you know what i mean but you probably just it just that s secret sauce whatever year it was when you started playing maybe your teacher was a jazz musician or what and you just held on to it, it yeah my teacher was a jazz guy in fact he's the guy who told me i should go to berkeley college of music and you know, I used to do private lessons with him once a week. And now, who's he this was guy? And his name was Larry Ramston. Mm -hmm. He was a teacher in the school district that I, you know, where I grew up, um, which was East Islip School District. Uh, but he te he taught at an elementary school, not the one I went to, a different one. But uh, my my elementary school band teacher when I was in, you know, third, fourth grade or whatever it was, he, he was really a trumpet player. And so he said, well, if you want to, get better you know you're gonna need to take lessons from a drummer and that was him so he, he referred me to mr ramson and i used to go there once a week you know for probably till i graduated high school you know yeah and he he really uh he turned me on to so many different things you know so i was listening when i was in junior high and high school i was listening to mahavishnu and chick korea and 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 don ellis and you know, buddy rich and all, all that stuff as well as Led Zeppelin and you know the Who and yeah. who, whoever else you know, and also for some reason Southern rock was a big thing on Long Island, so we used to listen to the Almond Brothers and all that stuff all the time too. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Uh. So that kind of like opened up my my musical palette, so to speak. You know. Mm -hmm. So I I I've always, you know, I've always played a lot of different styles. I learned how to read, so I can always you know 
I find that, uh, well, a couple things about reading for me, you know, being able to read means that you can do gigs that require that. So if yep. you can't read, you're, you're automatically eliminated. But also for, for me, I've always found it. I, I, I've charted out like everything, you know, when I get, asked to do an, uh, I used to get asked to do auditions or a new gig or whatever I would always if I if there was something for me to learn I'd, I'd chart it out because part of it was that I could use it you know but also for me when I do it it's almost like taking a picture of the song in my brain you know like I kind of like oh okay now I know understand the form better and I know where some of these where you know the certain the important fills or or kicks or whatever are in the song you know yeah so he was the one who gave me that foundation. Well, that, I mean, what a gift. I mean, that is that that I feel exactly the same way. By charting it, you're learning the song, you're you're ingraining it in your psyche, and then of course you have the ability because you can read music and anything changes last minute or anything needs to be added or subtracted, you could do it. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah exactly. You know, because there's a, there's a lot of guys that don't read classical Western notation, rhythmic notation, but they still come up with some sort of a way to like create an anatomy of a song and they've got slashes or different things that they yeah. you know but it doesn't look like western notation so so no. sometimes i'll get these guys if i look at you know by the end of the day you're gonna get to page 38 of the syncopation book and you're gonna figure <laughs> it you're, there's gonna be some light balls your brain is gonna explode it's going to allow you to hear a rhythmic figure, be able to write it out, or look at a rhythm fi rhythmic figure, be able to perform it, be able to count it, be able to scat it, be able to sing it, know what the have some rules for sticking. Because the last thing you want to do when someone's conducting or, is to think about what is the sticking for this figure. You know what I mean? You got to have some rules in place, you know, yeah. for stickings yeah. and such. But. I love teaching reading more than anything to people because it, it, to me, it's the most bang for the buck. They get the most return on their investment because now the whole world is their oyster. They can get yeah. books, the drum styles of Keith Moon, the drum styles of John Bottom, the drum styles of Stuart Copeland. Now they can read these things, steal this stuff, yeah. where if they're just rote learners, good luck, yeah. you know? Yeah, and you can, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a skill that, you know, you'll always have it, it you know why not why not develop that you know yeah. i just never really I, I you know it was it was basically taught to me be like you know this is what you have to do you know when i was a kid yeah. i didn't like get to argue and say oh i don't want to learn how to do this you know no, that's I, what he was and it was good i'm glad because now it's a skill that i've i've been using it since i was a kid yeah you know? And you and you won all that you won so many of these auditions in your in your in your career you had to win you had to go drive up to San Francisco and you, you know compete against a hundred other drummers or wasn't there like six yeah. callbacks for share? Yeah, something that, like that. Yeah, I mean that's crazy. <laughs> I mean that's it was, you, it was crazy, and everybody in town auditioned for that. It seemed like you know it was yeah. like a hundred guys on every instrument, you know, and and some really good guys, guys you've heard of, you know, and I. Yeah. I she doesn't care about that though she doesn't know or care about who's you know the cool session guy or or whatever she she was looking for what was right for her yeah. at that time and, and does, uh, yeah, it makes sense I, I was fortunate you know yeah, obviously you got to be able to play but you got to you know there's a, there's more to just the playing you, know, you got to be able to hang and and you know fit in nobody wants to be on the road with a jerk you know no. and uh, as i'm sure you've you you're well aware and and uh so, you know, you could be the greatest musician in the world, but if you can't hang the other 20 hours of the day or whatever it is, you know, nobody yeah. wants to be around you. You're not going to get the gig. There's plenty of guys who can do that, you know. Yeah. And well, you so, got to uh, figure it out, man, because, you know, the gigs just kept coming. So so that is a reflection of the, you know, the fact that people want to work with people they know, they like, and they trust. And you're, yeah, you, you're a good hang, man. <laughs> oh, thanks. You're, and, you know, you you've had the same thing, man. And you're you know you're fortunate. You've kept your gig for what twenty some years now with Jason. That's 20, amazing. Yeah, twenty three years. I'll take it. It's incredible. I mean, those are rare. And you know, it's so to have rare. a gig for that long. Yeah, very very rare to have gigs for that long. You know, yeah. I know a few guys that have done that. You being one of them, and Tom Van Skyke did that, and my buddy Dave Amato plays just, Ario. He's, yeah, he's, yeah, he's been with Ario now. 34 years i think Woo, just keeps rolling with the changes man for 30 something <laughs> years man yeah. um, he and I, funny story about dave he and i both got the share gig 
at the same time. And that same week was when he got the REO gig. He got both of those gigs the same week. <laughs> oh, my God. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, you know, I I think I got to meet Dave because I was a counselor at the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp like in 2017 or something like that. And mm -hmm. uh, Night Ranger was there and Ario was there and Foreigner was there. So these guys, yeah. you know, they these corporate guys pay big bucks and they get to hang out with these guys for yeah. a weekend. You know, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Dave's a great guy. He's, he was, he's one of my very good friends, you know, and been a, been a great great player and great you know had a great career for all these years so yeah man <clears throat> amazing yeah. so you ended up um so you started at seven you had a great teacher i'm i'm assuming very supportive parents and then you're at berkeley now were you one of the guys that finished berkeley or you're like i'm good no, <laughs> no i i went for two semesters so uh when i was like 16 still in high school i started uh working as a lifeguard in on the ocean in, in a town called ocean beach on the south on fire island and uh one of the guys that i was a lifeguard with was david decoveny <laughs> wow so the so, truth uh, is out there so so uh i went to berkeley uh when i was 17 because i graduated high school at 17 so uh, i turned 18 in the my first semester at berkeley and which was the fall of 77 and then I finished that first year and I came back and I was lifeguarding over the summer. And then I was uh, doing gigs on the weekends, you know, and I wound up doing this gig uh, with like an oldies band back then. And I just kept working with them. And so that kept happening. And so then I just thought, well, I'm just going to keep working. And I didn't go back to Berkeley. <laughs> so yeah. I was living in New York and I just kept working in the New York area. And I wound up doing a few other things and went to the Caribbean a couple of times and played in a, like a, a restaurant gig for like four months on the island of St. Martin. And then I had a cruise ship gig that I did, which went all over like 10 islands and Venezuela or whatever. Wow. And that was uh, the fall of 81 into the beginning of 82. And then after that, uh, I came back to New York and it was like, you know, negative 20 or some crazy thing. And I just was like, ah, I think I'll go to LA. So I moved to LA that spring. And uh, uh, so that was the spring of 82. And then, uh, you know, uh, so, th so th that's the long answer to no, I didn't go back to Berkeley. <laughs> well, you were working. You had, the, you had your crucial skill sets together. You already had a musical mind. You were very open-minded. You had been exposed to a lot of different kinds of music. And you had good technique and you could read. And so, obvi and obviously you got a great, there's a great hang side to you. And then as far as like your groove, your feel, your time, Man, when I was watching you play, I was like, this MF is just owning this, you know? I mean, this is like, an, it's like there is a clock inside of you, but it's an organic clock. It just, and everything is just served up with such ferocity and confidence. And it was just like the, the whole arrangement was laid out perfectly. Like you were just spelling it all out. All the groove choices were killer all the color choices whether it's riding a rim or riding on the snare or the cross stick or a tight hi-hat loosening it up to get to the chorus the body of the the ride the bell where you're putting crashes all the fills are all straight out of the motown classic rock stacks never gonna get you fired kind of <laughs> singer friendly shit it was just like this is why this guy has worked every day of his life for 30 years uh, thank 40 you. years you make a lot of good points there i mean thank you for the compliments i really appreciate it i'll tell you f another funny story when i when i first joined the storm so i, I auditioned for the storm and steve smith uh had done the first record and and he left the band so i was replacing him and uh the the keyboard player and the bass player in the storm was greg raleigh and ross valerie who were founding members of journey and greg yeah is a founding member of Santana. He's all, he's the original keyboard player and lead singer for Santana. So he's actually a two time rock and roll hall of fame inductee because he founded both of those bands. And so was he was on stage at Woodstock with Michael Shreve at 17, taking that yeah. drum solo. Whoa. Yeah. 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 That's Greg. Amazing. Greg, uh, Greg sang black magic woman and evil ways. And all, you come about. all those songs. That's Greg singing. Ah, so, yeah. And Greg's a very close friend of mine. Now we've worked together now since, since I joined the storm. So when I joined the storm, 
a couple things talking about you know playing the right thing for the song one of the songs they asked me to learn for the audition was black magic woman because we played that but we didn't have any percussion so i kind of had to figure out a way to sort of emulate the groove and some of the percussion you know the cowbell and some stuff going on which i came up with my best shot and he seemed to he seemed to like that but uh so so two things that he said that i'll never forget one was when he auditioned some of the other uh guys that played a lot of them were just you know only rock drummers they they weren't like able to play any kind of other styles really and and black magic woman is not really a rock song it's got you know it's it's got like latin stuff there's some samba in the in the outro part you know and uh so he told me that one of the guys that uh audition you know he was just a meat and potatoes rock guy probably really good at that but he couldn't play the black magic woman thing and he, he actually said to him so that's how you hear that <laughs> and he just thought he just the guy just doesn't and I, and I don't know who it was, but he 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 just doesn't hear this music the right that way. way he right. doesn't have that palate, you know. But the other thing that Greg said to me, which which uh, always stuck with me, was you know when I was singing and playing, and you and I you know you were auditioning. He says you never played anything that made me go like, what was that? Right. And that that's important. You know, you, you don't ever want to as the drummer. You're there to support at least in my opinion, to support the singer, the soloist, you know, yeah. the song and the music, you know, and it's cool to play some good, you know, some cool stuff, but it's got to be in the right place. You can't, you can't be making the singer go like that while they're trying to sing the lead vocal, you know? It's so I'm trying to, I'm guessing that if I had to take some of the percussion parts and incorporate them, so there's maracas, there's a widow, there's probably a, a bongo part, and there's uh, definitely the in bat on day and go go day and ba in day and go go. So I'd probably have the the widow part as and then acrostic thing and the bass drum pattern ink in in go go ink go go right. And then the yeah, outro is go go down down bang go 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 ding go ding, which either can be like ding ka ding ka ding or it could be day. It could almost be a uh, a songo type fusion thing you know yeah yeah well the way i wound up doing it was uh, uh you know i i kind of i learned this i had a, a jazz drum teacher on long island at when i was older not the guy that we talked about earlier a guy named mickey sheen who you know he's kind of uh, in that gene krupa yeah thing. he taught me one time he taught me this uh i guess you would call it a cha-cha but it was basically your left hand is on the hi-hat and it's playing um so your your foot's playing quarter notes and your 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 hand is playing upbeats ah right? so it gives you that that little like you were saying the guido thing and then i was playing quarter notes on the um cowbell with the doom doom right on the tom so doom 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 right and the bass drum was just a straight it was really like a cha-cha kind of so it's doom that was kind of the foundational groove which isn't really what shreve played in the original song he played more of like a rumba but but it worked for that because there was no percussion there was nobody doing all the yeah anga stuff right so the the rumba then, slash bolero type like, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah right yeah, that's kind of, I think that's more like, if I listen, I, ha I haven't heard it in a while, but I think that's more like what Shreve played on the original record. But he had all that other, you know, he had Chapito playing timbales and Carabella playing congas and all that stuff. And then the outro is actually a different song. I don't, a lot of people don't realize that, that doon, 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 doon. That's not Black Magic Woman. That's ah. actually a song called uh, Gypsy Queen, which ah. was, uh, was, um, Who's the guy that did that? Uh, Gabor Zabo did that song, and they just put them together, right? That's what happened when Santana did it. Uh, Black Magic Woman is actually a, a Peter Green song. It was a, it was originally done by Fleetwood Mac, ah, and it, and it wasn't done Latin. You know, they Santana changed the whole thing around. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so Shreve, I think on on the outro is is on the on the Gypsy Queen part is really playing like. 16th on the hi-hat and, and like a dun, 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 on the bass drum so but i i 
because we did, again didn't have percussion. I kind of changed that up and I did more like a samba, like a boom, 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 on the bass drum with a kind of like a ding, 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 ding and, and like some stuff on the toms just to kind of give it some of that, you know. Ding, 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 almost like a Mozambique pattern with the samba foot pattern. That always works. Yeah. So that's kind of how I wound up doing it. So, Dude, I am the <laughs> same kind of drummer where it's like if they want a guy who's familiar with some of these other folklorical women, uh, like rhythms, and it's served up with like a, it's incorporated, it's served up with an, an rock attitude, like you're going to be happy. But if you want a guy that's like grew up in that country and like grew up speaking that yeah. like, like it's like, yeah, I'm not the right guy. You know what I'm I mean? I'm not that guy either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Greg, Greg Raleigh, you know, he, he, People don't realize this either. He's half Swedish and half Norwegian. I'm ah. half Norwegian. Ah, so so he he used to always make a joke. You know, he's, if you want to have a really great Latin rock band, you got to have a couple of Norwegians. You know, and that look was at that. Us. <laughs> I got I got to interview uh, Peter Stormare, the actor that was he played the devil in Constantine, and he was the guy that put uh, the girl in the wood chipper in Fargo. Oh really? Yeah, oh, wow. <laughs> he's from he's from that part of the world, man. Very very funny, and of course plays music. There's so many musicians that so many actors that play musical instruments, you know. So yeah. did Coveney? Did you ever keep in touch with him? You know, not until I, I didn't for a long time, but recently he he actually emailed me out of the blue and said, "Hey man, I heard you've been doing great or whatever." And some somehow somebody he knew knew me or something, and he got my email. So he he sent me an email, and then I just was. Uh, we were doing a gig with Steve down in Key Largo and I saw a program about um, where they, they go back into people's histories and, and and he was on it. So they were, they were going back into his family history. And so I, I sent him an email, Hey, I just saw your thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I, I haven't seen him in a long time, but he did say uh, him, he might come to the gig and we're playing in LA in September. So I'm, I'm going to touch base with him. Then maybe we'll get together. Nice. That'd be Gr- cool. Greek yeah, theater. He's a good guy. You guys do so the Greek we're theater? actually we're actually doing a new venue out there. It's called the YouTube Theater, which is at uh, SoFi Stadium. So I guess ah. it's a brand new thing. So yeah. So it's part of SoFi Stadium. Yeah, yeah. We're not doing the stadium. We're not that big. But in <laughs> uh, the YouTube Theater, that sounds fun. Yeah. yeah totally cool. cool. So you were in LA for twenty three years. So you saw some yeah, really you know formative years of music making out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I got there in 82. And yeah, I was there for a good part of the, you know, what happened in the 80s and all, you know, all the stuff in the 90s, obviously. And uh, yeah, it was great. I mean, when I first moved to LA in 82, you know, I didn't know anybody except for one guy, I, I, uh, a guitar player named Jamie Glazer, who, uh, another amazing guitar player, he, he played with John Ponty and Chick Corea and Manhattan Transfer and you know, rock bands. He, he was on a Brian Adams record, you know, and so he was kind of like my, my first connection to getting gigs and stuff like that. And, um, <clears throat> but what I wound up doing was uh, finding out where people were playing. And so I would go down to these clubs, you know, one was called the flying jib and, and every Monday night there was a band that played at the flying jib, uh, which was called the Dave Boroff band. And Dave was a sax player, but the guys in the band were as follows. Neil Steubenhaus was the regular bass player, but he was often when it, when he couldn't do it, he was subbed uh, by Nathan East. <laughs> Not bad. The drummer, the drummer was Vinny Caliuta. Not bad. You know, I mean, it was that that kind of thing. You know, so I went there like every Monday, and it was like taking lessons, watching Vinny. You know, and and uh, and, and I'd go to other clubs. There was one in Sherman Oaks called uh, Josephina's and go down to the baked potato, you know, just as, as many places I, as I could to meet people. Yeah. Try to, you know, figure out the LA scene and gradually, you know, you, you, you get on some gigs and people call you for some rehearsals and you do a whole bunch of stuff for free and, you know, yeah, it just takes time and unfold. You just, you just got to build it up. And that's what I did. And I was young. I was what, 22 when I moved there. So I was, you know, I was eager to do whatever I could, you know, uh, for a long time, I I, uh, I worked a day job when I first got there, and then I worked at Guitar Center. And when I was at Guitar Center, I didn't last there very long. I was like two weeks or something. Uh, the one I on Sunset? No, it was a it was in Sherman Oaks. They it was oh, yeah. a brand new location in Sherman yeah. Oaks, not the one that's there now. Ah, but it, it was over uh, between Kester and Van Nuys Boulevard on the on the south side of Ventura. And uh, uh, Dave Weiderman was 
he and I both started there at the same time. And then he went on to, he made a career with Guitar Center. I lasted about two weeks. But when I was there, I was working like six days a week. And I also had a gig in a top 40 band six nights a week, about an hour away. So I was just like <sighs> burning it at both ends. You know? Nice. That's but, like a, yeah, such just, a such a incredible time in someone's career in those early to mid twenties where you're like making it happen. You have that vision, yeah. you have the focus, you have a dream, and you're like, yeah, sleep when I'm dead, man. I never turned anything down, you know, I, I, unless I couldn't, like, literally just couldn't do it, you know. But I mean, if I if I got called for you know three gigs on a Saturday and I could make it to all of them, I'd do them, you know. Yeah, I just totally. wanted to do as much as I could, you know. And, <sighs> It was it was the experience of playing. It was meeting other people. It was you know all of that stuff and and you know so some of it is networking. You know obviously you know that's how you get these calls is other people get to know you and you know like you or appreciate you or whatever and and uh, they call you for stuff. Hopefully you know if you're, sure. if you're not a jerk. <laughs> yeah. And so you so. did that. You did that LA thing for twenty three years and then uh, why Austin? Because you wanted the change from LA and then you're like, Oh my God, this is a vibrant music scene. Well, uh, at the time I was, I was married and we had, uh, you know, I'm, I'm divorced now, but, uh, we had a couple of kids and, and LA was getting kind of like, there weren't as many gigs like locally, you know, right. there just wasn't, the scene was kind of changing. This was like 2005, almost 2006. Yeah. And there wasn't that much to do there specifically and the market the housing market was insane this was right before the big crash yeah that happened i was like two years ahead of that excuse me but um that was i started looking around you know i had bought this house and uh it was like worth five times what i bought it for and you know all this and i started starting to think man i can't afford my own house like if i was to try to buy it now you know oh yeah like, that's what happened in nashville so uh so i but austin wasn't like that so i was able to so i i had a small house in la it was it was about not quite two thousand square feet i did have a little studio in there i started doing remote drum recording in 1998 before was it was it. cool before it was hip yeah. <laughs> sending cd roms back and forth to people in the mail you know amazing um so uh so i had this house you know and i I was looking in Austin and uh, you could get a brand new house, like 4,000 square foot house for like half the price of like twice as big with a couple of acres. And, and, and it did have a, a great music scene and all this stuff. And I just thought, you know, I don't really need to be here because I'm not doing that much locally. And the gigs that I was doing, I was flying to, you know, yeah. the, so I could fly from anywhere. And it turned out after I moved to Austin, I told Greg Raleigh about it, and he wound up moving the next year. Amazing. <laughs> he followed me out there. Todd Zuckerman, uh, Ricky Phillips, both of the guys in six. Ricky I've known for many years. They both moved there. You know, we all use the same realtor. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah I like so, I, yeah. yeah. It was a little bit about, you know, it was financial oh. and 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 the scene and, and you know sort of my my life had changed a, a bit at that point you know yeah i miss that weather man sunny and 70 you don't even need a weather girl <laughs> yeah. they've got the weather girl for the eye candy just to keep the viewers because the weather report is exactly the same every day <laughs> yeah right it never yeah. rains and so yeah <laughs> it's it's got to be weird at christmas you know what i mean but but uh candy, it, you, yeah. i'm sure you get used to it yeah Oh, well, you know, it's like anything else. You get used to wherever you are, you know. Yeah, man. Well, I mean, what a what a career tra tra trajectory, man. I mean, just so so impressive. And now, yeah, I mean, you people know you in the New York scene. They know you in the L.A. scene. They know you in the Texas scene. You've had all these gigs, a variety of genres, hallmarks in the rock and pop world. And um, tell us about the Credence thing, because are there two – there's Credence – clear water revisited and now is there another version of that as well or no is it the same thing yeah so so there's a little bit of history uh the original credence clearwater revival was john fogarty his brother tom and the bass player was Stu cook and the drummer mm -hmm. was doug clifford to call him cosmo cosmo right yeah. so that's the original credence clearwater revival well, they got inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame i think around 1992 93 somewhere in that vicinity and for many years 
uh, John has been feuding with the other three guys, including his brother, Tom. Ouch. Tom, Tom actually died in, I think it was 1990. Um, he, he died of AIDS, but he was, you know, he was married. He wasn't, he wasn't, he just got a bad blood transfusion. Ouch. Uh, very That's, unfortunate. Man. But anyway, they, they were feuding. And when they got inducted into the hall of fame, the three remaining, you know, uh, original members, John, Stu and Doug, you know, normally the bands play together. Well, John refused to play with Stu and Doug for some reason. I don't know what the, you know, all the details are. And then uh, out of that, Stu and Doug decided because at that time John also wasn't playing, and and when he did play, I don't think he was playing any of the Credence catalog. So, uh, so they put together this band called Clear, Credence Clearwater Revisited, and the original members of that band was those two guys, uh, a, a guy named Steve Gunner playing keyboards and guitar and singing, and uh, they got a lead singer named John Tristeo, and Elliot Easton of the Cars was the ah. guitar player. Yeah. yeah. And so that was the band for, I don't know, 10, 10 or more years, maybe, maybe 12 years or something like that. And then um, they went through a couple of other changes. Well, we wound up doing a couple of gigs when I was in Greg Raleigh's band. We did a couple of gigs with them, uh, you know, like uh, festivals and, you know, that type of thing. And uh, they needed a new guitar player and they liked our guy, Kurt, a guy named Kurt Griffey, who's a very dear friend of mine. Um, he was playing with Greg Raleigh and, uh, um, he was also friends with Steve Gunner, who was in Credence. And so when they needed a new guitar player, they eventually, they asked Kurt to do it. And he wound up eventually joining them in 2011. And, uh, about two years later, I think it was 2013, Doug called me up out of the blue one day and said, Hey, uh, I threw my back out. Can you do, we've got three shows Ugh. coming up. Can you do them? And I was like, yeah, of course I'll be glad to, you know, and as luck would have it, um, I was supposed to be doing a gig with Eddie money that week, but he canceled it. <laughs> so oh I was able God. to do the credence gigs. And so, uh, so I, you know, another one of those situations, I had 20 songs to learn. I started charting them all out and, you know, a day to get them ready, show up, sound check, I got my iPad with my charts and they are a band that does the arrangements the same way every night, which, which made it a lot easier. Nice. So, uh, I had my iPad with my charts on it and we, you know, went over some stuff at soundcheck and I did the three shows and then about, you know, then Doug got, came back and then about a year, a little over a year later, I got another call from Doug. Hey, you know, I threw my back out. Can you do some more shows? <laughs> so I wound up doing that. Well, then it turned out that he had some other, um, health issues that he needed to address and uh i wound up doing a, a whole year with them or, or a little over a year actually um and so i don't know 60 70 shows or whatever it was we went to south america did a bunch of stuff and it was great fun you know playing all that credence stuff. i mean and they, fortunate they, son and all those oh, this incredible. american songbook oh yeah it's incredible and every song it's like every song is a hit you know i mean and, and they did it great and they they had you know, they, we played good sized venues, you know, really, it wasn't, it wasn't like just, you know, a tribute kind of thing. And, you know, it was really good, really well done. And, uh, so then, you know, Doug got better and he came back, but he still, you know, couldn't do certain things. So I wound up filling in for him a, a whole bunch of times after that. And then when the pandemic happened, uh, they had some shows. They were actually getting ready to just stop because I think Doug just wanted to call it quits. They'd been doing it for like 25 or 26 years at that point. And uh, they had a few other shows in, uh, down in South America that I was going to do. But then the, the pandemic sort of canceled all of that. Well, then um, they just wound up not doing it anymore. So um, the singer, uh, eventually Johnny Tristeo left and they got another singer named Dan McGinnis. But him and Kurt, they just thought, well, you know, maybe we'll still do this. And their manager wanted to keep doing it. So basically they have a thing now called revisiting credence. It's not an official, there's nobody from the original band, but it's just a, a fun thing to go out and play the credence songs, Great. you know, and the same manager manages it. And so whenever I'm able to, I go and do some gigs with them. So that, remember I told you I did four shows and three in, in a, one of them was with them in Mexico city. And it was a great gig. It was like 8,000 people at, at this festival and 
cool and the gang opened for us <laughs> you nice. know, it was a blast. so um so yeah we we do that and if i can't do it there's a couple of other guys that that you know fill in for me whatever and uh awesome yeah, man great. put, put yeah. my name on the list man i'll learn the songs <laughs> absolutely you know what a funny thing that happened i would I'd definitely call you for that w- one time uh last year i was getting ready to do Summerfest with steve we we had a show in Chicago at Ravinia and then Summerfest the next night. And then I had two shows with Revisiting Credence, one in Long Island and one in New Jersey. And it was like, so I did summer I was gonna do Summerfest, get up early, take a flight to New York, play that night on Long Island, right? Two days before we were going to uh, Chicago, Steve's manager calls and says, Hey, I got great news. We just added a show and and we're gonna do two nights at Summerfest now instead of only one. Oh because no. Ann, because Ann Wilson's Somebody in our crew got COVID or something. So it was great. So we, you know, we did two shows, but it meant I couldn't do the revisiting gigs and it's two days away. Right? Ouch. So I'm thinking, who do I know in New York that can do this gig? And I, I didn't actually know him, but I wound up getting Liberty DeVito's number and he did it. Oh, Liv did was, it. It's awesome. And he was great. He did two, two, two shows. He learned everything and the guys loved him and he was great great vibe and everything, oh. you know, so it worked out killer you know that worked totally worked out killer because yeah. there's like a lib david uh not david duchovny um i was doing this jam session one time at, in la and um the guy the actor eric mccormick from um oh. yeah the, the what the heck show is that i need my prevagen but anyways grace. yeah will and grace so he he's he loves to sing so he's at this jam session and he goes, oh, man, I like it. You remind me of that guy that used to play with Billy Joel who's just like, <laughs> I love my life. I yeah. love my He goes, you just love your life. I mean, he's, I was like, well, I'll take that as a compliment. It was really hilarious. Yeah, absolutely. Man. Do you know uh, a keyboard player named Lauren Gold? Yes, I pl- jammed with Lauren many times um, in L.A. at those jam nights at the um, bowling alley there on Hi- Sunset and Highland or what is it? Um highland and hollywood corner of holly uh, hollywood and highland yeah yes yeah, so i think he's pretty good friends with eric mccormick that's how i know yeah that connection yeah, well, yeah. And lauren's you know playing with the who in chicago now but i've known lauren since the mid 90s he was a when i was in Cher's band the opening act was a guy named dom herrera was a comedian yeah and lauren, lauren and dom were friends because lauren used to play piano at i think it was the comedy store one of those places and so so dom introduced me to lauren and we used to you know hang out a little bit i actually did one of lauren's solo records a record called keys which is like a smooth jazz type of record you know beautiful and uh so yeah i, I did that that was over 20 years ago but yeah so yeah, i saw, I saw that one. i saw that on your website there is to all your listeners out there a partial discography <laughs> at ronwixo.com it's a work in progress i mean surely you can't remember you know all the records you played on unless you made note of it that year the years start to go by and you're like oh yeah that one wasn't major label it wasn't really quite even indie but you know you did it you spent the time yeah. together you just sure. forget about it you know there's a lot of those and there's a lot of them now i mean i've been doing this now for 25 years or more where people send you the tracks you know and and a lot of those records i never even meet the people that's on that i'm on them with you know uh, me too me too and so uh you know uh, yeah it's there's a million of them and i don't know it, I, I bet i've done a couple thousand tracks that way now and yeah and i don't remember half of them <laughs> it's so crazy <laughs> when someone trusts you like you know they listen to your body or work they get a sense you know you, you let them know that you have that offering next thing you know there's an mp3 demo in your email and then and then there's all the stems and you pull it all up and and then you say look at i'm gonna make the pass and then you know be available for this three hour window and then they listen to the mp3 and they go I don't know if I would change anything. I mean, maybe you could ride the floor, Tom, on the bridge, you know, do one pass instead of the bell. And you're like, no problem. And then you add your little tambourine shaker, PayPal. Everybody's happy. Yeah, it's amazing. It's it's a whole other thing, man. Back in the 80s, it was, you know, cartage and get to the studio three hours ahead of time because we've got to get drum sounds. And, you know, hopefully we'll get a couple songs today. You know, it's, it's totally different now. Oh, my yeah. stuff i don't know about you but my stuff just stays set up the mics are all there you know i just have to turn everything on i've got a template in logic yep just pull up the template and everything's already routed you know so it's yeah. it's it's a whole other approach it's so and fun now, you know, yeah 
now you get people where you know sometimes you're you're the last guy on instead of the first guy on you know, yeah you're, you're replacing the drum machine or a loop or or sometimes another drummer or whatever but all the other stuff is already done you know yeah so I've done it, yeah, just like you, every way where it's, sometimes it's just literally a scratch vocal and an acoustic guitar. I'm like, I yeah. got to have, send me that vocal, man. And then they can, like, <laughs> you know, it'd be really nice if there was a bass on there. Sometimes you do it without the bass and you dictate, like, hey, this is these are the kick drum patterns I'm hearing to complement yeah. the feel of the song and the harmonic changes. But, you know, if you, if you could throw a bass on there, that kind of would be cool. So you do it any way it comes. Yeah. Yeah, I just exactly. Sometimes, like you said, you know, if it's just like an acoustic and a vocal, you wind up sort of dictating what the arrangement is eventually going to become. Yeah, because the, of the way you played the drum part, you know, and the spirit. Like, hey, is this yeah. a tight hi hat or is this an open hi? I mean, it's like you end up pretty much producing the track from your yeah. ground up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> I love it. I had Denny Fongheiser on. Did you cross paths with him back in the day? I knew Denny. Yeah, yeah. Sure. He was like, yeah. man, we used to bring, f I used to bring five bass drums, 35 snare drums, bags and bags of cymbals. And, you know, he's like, now I'm at my place. And if I do yeah. go to the studio, it's like one tube of five snare drums, you know, one bass drum, maybe a couple of bags of cymbals. Because the, the sessions we do around here, I mean, there's probably, you know, 30 guys in town that work all the time that have their stuff in cartage. But, man, we've got a... I mean, that Black Beauty is going to be on there. Maybe the Superphonic and maybe the Deep Dish with all the gaff tape. Then you have, okay, is it going to be like bigger symbols, smaller symbols? And we got to do it quick. Yeah. Oh, none, yeah. Of the, none of the, where are we going to lunch today and pussyfooting yeah. around? It's like <laughs> five o'clock. We better have one, two, three, four. So, I don't, how many songs did we do the other day uh, for Aldine? We do one song every 90 minutes. So we did four songs between 10 and five. That's that's a productive day, you know. Yeah. A, and I mean, you know, people don't have the half million dollar album budgets anymore, you know. know. <laughs> and and they're not you know, pe back in those days bands were like shooting half of that stuff up their nose or something, yeah. you know. I don't know what the heck they were doing, you know. Yeah. I never did any of that stuff, but uh So but, you you, you know, escaped that, all the trappings of rock and roll. You never even came close to uh When I when I was on the David Lee Roth band, you know, I was the guy with the diet coke, you know. <laughs> It's got to get my aspartame fix. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't doing the any of that stuff. You know. Yeah. Not, not that anybody else was. I'm not accusing anybody. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know. I mean, that there's a, a couple of those drugs are definitely life ruiners. You know, you you don't want to open oh, up yeah. Pandora's box. You know. Yeah, no, I, was, I never got into any of that stuff. I I couldn't function if I did any of that stuff. No, I, I just, no way. I just you know, I I felt like I had a. I had a, I don't know, I guess I'm, I've always tried to be responsible. You know, I show up on time and I try to, you know, try to do as best I can, you know, and I just felt like doing that sort of stuff was not going to help me. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right, man. Oh, incredible. You know, when I, another thing I was listening to you and it was really freaky when I saw you at that amphitheater because um, I was like, this is, we're a similar age. Our vocabulary was, I was like, oh my god i would have done that same fill and it was not just like you know a lot of them are what, what i call a macro rhythm so your mac your big picture rhythm bop boom baga doom of course you know how many times are you going to do pat boom baby boom and just orchestrating it just with your hands on different surfaces there's a million ways yeah. to get around it but then if you add the grace notes the little tiny grace notes or if you put your bass drums kapu, kapu, kaka, doom, or kapu, doom, gru, gru, doom, there's a f there's a flam in there i was like this guy's in my head i i i i do that phil you know what i mean we have a very like yeah. and then you have your like fake double bass thing you fracas to fracas so you're riding the floor oh, tom yeah. and you do your fraca do good do good fraca do good fraca fraca do's and i was like oh, i do that shit all the time <laughs> i was like it was scary i was like well, yeah i think we we're stealing from the same people yeah, you know, maybe we're you know you're my brother from another mother or something. Yeah, I was you know, like, dang there. man. <laughs> hey, you know, great minds think alike, right? I mean, that's, that's it was I great. Look at that. I really yeah, enjoyed the show, that. man. I really, really I enjoyed that show. That. And you, um, and if guys want to see where you're going to play, the tour dates are around Wixo dot com as well, right? I I have them up there, or you can go to Steve's website. Yeah, perfect. SteveMiller dot com. Yeah. yeah, and you do any yeah. teaching ever? Is that part of your, your diet? I used to do more of that, you know, I, I haven't done that in a while, but yeah, you know, and I, I kind of had a similar approach as you, you know, I, I like to teach 
kids how to read. A lot of, a lot of kids are resistant to that sort of thing, but you know, I teach them what they want to know too, but I try to teach them some foundational technique and, and uh, you know, stuff that I think that can serve them well going forward. You know, uh, even if they don't think that at the time, you know. Yeah. Which, so, so reading is part of that, you know. That's the way to do it. And then, what is your warm up? Do you do you do you warm up before the show? Twenty minutes, thirty oh, minutes, yeah. six. Yeah, I usually I do a bunch of stretches. I do this. Uh, let me see if I got a pair of sticks here. I do this one stretch that actually my drum teacher, Mr. Ram, Larry Ramson, taught me. Where you hold your sticks like this and you flip. Damn, Ron, I do the same one, buddy. I show people that sometimes and they're all like, "How did you?" What do is that? that? I, yeah, <laughs> you know. So I do a lot of that stretching, you know, and behind my back, you know, all the stuff that you that we all know. And so I try to make sure that I'm not starting to warm up with where my muscles are tight, you know. So I and, and then I, uh, you know, just do like paradiddle diddles and different ru rhythmic rudimental things. A lot of times I do that on a. Uh, surface that doesn't have any bounce, you know, like a, a pillow or my leg, <laughs> yeah, know, whatever, just to kind of get the, you know, get the fingers and the wrist muscles and all that stuff working and, you know, stretch my legs and all that. And I love the pillow. Steve, yeah. It's yeah. Cool. With Steve, we usually have, uh, d depends, not every day, but we, we usually have a, you know, hour and a half sound check type thing, sometimes more. Uh, so we get, you know, we, we get loose during that, but then there's a couple hours be before the show. So I got to kind of re warm up, you know, yeah. but, uh, yeah, it's important to, I think to stay, to be loose before you play, because there's nothing worse than being tight on the gig and then trying to execute something and you're, you're you know, you're trying to hang out to the stick and <laughs> your muscles are going, no, oh, you, no, you got to warm up, man. Yeah. You got to warm up. It's very Incredible. important. And you, you got to try to stay loose while you're playing too. I, I sometimes very intentionally think to myself, okay, you know, loosen your grip here or loosen up your, like, don't get too intense because then it, you'll get too tight, you know? Yeah. So now, it was, it was poetry in motion, man. I really enjoyed hearing you play. And I, I would definitely got to make sure that, you know, however long it was, 15 years don't go by yeah. before we see each other again. Absolutely. And likewise, I, you know, I've seen you, live a couple times and also uh, yeah, i've seen a bunch of the stuff you've done on tv and you're always killing it man i, oh, I love man. you playing too i sure appreciate really it man. appreciate everything you do man oh Very dude cool. likewise man and so hey you listeners out there you guys if you want ron to play a show with you you want him to record tracks for your album you want to take a lesson ron wixo w-i-k-s-o dot com ron wixo dot com and also wanted to thank my co-host sometimes i have a co-host he's a great drummer jim mccarthy he's also a voice over voiceover artist good pal of mine jim mccarthy voiceovers.com we owe a lot to him and hey my publisher would be really upset if i don't do this but i just cranked out a book <laughs> called making it in country music and insiders awesome. look at the industry you can get that from jeff bezos.com and if you guys <laughs> love the show if you guys are listening out there you love the show be sure to subscribe share rate and review leave us some positive comments that allows people to find our podcast on this crazy world wide web much faster ron i sure appreciate it man yeah likewise thanks for having me on man this has been the rich redmond show subscribe rate and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts